Um, thank you for allowing me the honor of being here this morning and sharing with you the next three weeks. And um, for many, many years, John has been been my pastor, even though I haven't been coming to church here because I've been serving in other churches. Um, and and sometimes, I think many times, as uh, those of us who are who are in vocational ministry, we don't. We don't have a pastor sometimes, and and John has been that for me. And I know I know so many of you, and y'all have welcomed our family over the past few months. And uh, so I feel I feel at home, and I pray that uh, the next three weeks God will do what He does best and and speak to us through His Word. Um, I'm going to make it real easy on you this morning when I ask you to turn in your Bibles. Um, because I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis 1. I'm not going to say that's on page 1 of your Bibles, because it might not be. I know I've got all this other stuff in the front, but uh, you shouldn't have too much trouble finding it. Look here, i got water. <clears throat> Genesis 1. My, my hope, and it may or may not work out this way, my hope is that over the next three weeks we'll be able to look at Genesis 1 two, and three. I'm not making any promises, uh, but that's, that's the idea. Um, and so today we're going to look at Genesis 1. And I think whether you are a Christian or not, whether you believe in God or not, um, whether you've ever read the Bible or not, most people in our Western culture are very familiar with the words, in the beginning, God created right? That's just, it's kind of part of our vernacular. We just know those words. In fact, um, on Christmas Eve of 1968, as the Apollo 8 uh, space mission was rounding the moon for the first time, no human beings had ever gone around the moon. And so these guys were going to be able to see something that no human beings had ever seen before. And it was they were going to see the earth come up over the horizon of the moon instead of the moon coming up over the horizon of the earth. And as they, as they rounded the moon, astronaut Bill Anders read the first four verses of Genesis 1 for, I don't know, perhaps millions of people to hear as they're, as they're listening to the, to the broadcast from the space capsule. The other, the other two astronauts continued and they read, you know, something like the first 10 verses of, of the chapter. But of all the things that you could say when, when you're the first human beings to see the earth come up over the moon and they chose this. If we don't get the beginning right... Then, the, then there's not a lot of hope for the rest, okay? Uh, think about it this way, and if anybody has ever done <clears throat> any kind of navigation, uh, think specifically with a map and compass. If, if your, if your uh, azimuth is off by one degree, 100 yards from now, that's not a big deal. You can fix it. But a mile, two miles down the road, that one degree of difference at the beginning is a lot of difference at the end. Trust me, I found that out the hard way on some land nav courses. <laughs> if we don't get the beginning right, there's not a lot of hope for the rest. And if we do get it right, then our worldview, our philosophy, our theology is, is going to be affected. It's going to be founded on, on the truth. It's going to be founded on, on what is right and what is good. And it's founded on, on God's word and his design. Some of uh, these chapters, especially the first three chapters of Genesis, do become some of the most debated words of Scripture, and, and certainly uh, some of the, our greatest questions arise. You know, what, do, does it mean what it says? You know, how, how are we to interpret these three chapters of, of Genesis? Is it meant to be kind of mythological, is it, is it, or is it meant to be historical fact, or how do we, you know, what are we supposed to get out of this? Does science contradict what God has revealed in His Word? These are some of the questions that we ask ourselves as, as we look 
into these, these chapters. It's also important to note that some of the most fundamental questions of humanity are answered right here. Where did we come from? I think that, that might be the most fundamental question of all humans. Where did we come from? You know, how did we get here? Is there a God? Is there a higher power or are we just, is this just it? What are we here for? Anybody ever sat there in the darkness of the night going, why am I here? Are human beings of any value or worth? Or are we just highly evolved animals? These questions are answered for us in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. So this morning we're just simply going to look at chapter 1. And I realize it's a bit lengthy, but I want to read uh, the entirety of chapter 1 of Genesis. So please follow along. Uh, Rob, I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. <laughs> just for you. No. <clears throat> but please follow along. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was an evening, and there was a morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came, and then morning, the second day. Then God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule over the night, as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide a light on the earth, to rule the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening came and then morning, the fourth day. Then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came and then morning, the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, 
and for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw that all he had made, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word. This is what you have revealed uh, to, to your people. This is what you inspired to have written down, and we trust it. It is our authority, and it is true. And Father, as, as we open your word now, I pray that, uh, that you would speak to your people through your word. Uh, Father, that you'd give me the words to speak to your sheep. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So there we have it. I mean, that is the creation account in Genesis 1. Now, there's, it gets, we get a more detailed version in Genesis 2 that we'll talk about, hopefully, uh, next week. Uh, but what we're looking at here is, is more than just a, uh, a Hebrew creation myth or Hebrew creation epic. Because look, look, to be fair, every culture that I can think of in all of human history has had some explanation for how we got here, okay? Uh, in the ancient Near East, which is where Genesis was written, uh, they have their own stories, and we'll talk about some of those in just a minute. Um, you know, Native Americans have their own stories. Every culture has its own explanation for how we got here. Even today, in 2023, if you don't believe in God, you have an explanation for how we got here. A long time and a whole lot of accidents. That's how we got here. This isn't just one added to all the others. This isn't even just one added to all the others in, in the ancient Near East at the time. It's more than a Hebrew creation account. In fact, it is a, it is a polemic, it is, a, it is an attack on the other false creation accounts. In the ancient Sumerian account of, of creation, there is, uh, you know, all of the gods are associated with the different elements of nature. And there's this battle, there's chaos, which we see elements of chaos here, right? The formless and empty and uh, void, and there was chaotic waters. There's chaos going on, but the gods of the, the sky and the gods of the water are struggling to figure out who's going to be in charge and how they're going to make it right. That's not what we see here. Instead, what we see is, uh, is a, a disorganized, formless, and empty creation, and then God stepping in and saying, here's how it's going to be. And God speaking and his creation responding precisely how he wants it to. There is no battle. <laughs> there is God standing over his creation telling it what to do. And every time he speaks, it happens. Every time he speaks, it happens. Sometimes in these ancient creation epics, there's, uh, when it comes to the creation of, of humanity, it's rather an accident. Uh, it's, it, at best, it's kind of an afterthought. Uh, in some of the ancient creation stories, it's, um, it's just downright accidental. Like, oh, whoops, we just created people. Oh, now what are we going to do with them? Well, let's annoy them, you know. Or, or we get created because the gods are hungry and they need somebody to bring them food, right? Which makes total sense when you think about how people used to worship the gods. What do you do? Let's bring them some food. That's not the picture that we're given in Genesis 1. Instead, we are given a picture of a God who intentionally and, and um, specifically creates the world. And he intentionally, I mean, there's even this, this pause where, where God, and depending on how you look at it, I believe that, that it's referencing the, the Trinitarian us in, uh, in verse 26, that when God says, let us make man in our image, to me, that's, that's evidence of God, what we know to be true, and a, a triune God kind of saying, having a, having a powwow, and saying, let us make man in our image. 
We are intentionally created for a purpose. And then he gives us what that purpose is, right? And it's not because God was hungry and he needed somebody to bring him food. It wasn't a oopsie-daisy. I was just doing my thing and now these people are here and I don't know what to do with them. Because later on they're going to get noisy and I'm going to have to uh, take them out. That's not the picture that we're given. Instead, in Genesis, in God's word, in the true story of creation, humanity is the crowning achievement of creation. That's the, that's the pinnacle of creation is that God has, has made this world and he places his image bearers in it. And we're going to talk more about that, um, what it means to be an image bearer of God next week, Lord willing. The Genesis account of creation takes all of the competing creation stories uh, from the ancient Near East at the time and it just turns them on their head, turns them upside down, showing that God, that Yahweh, Elohim, is how, he is, is how God is referred to in Genesis 1, that he is superior. Superior to all the gods, and his creation is superior to all of their stories. There are no accidents in God's good creation. Everything is intentional. So as we look back at the beginning, in the beginning, God created. We find that God was God existed before time, and and God still exists outside of time. He is transcendent over time. He existed before time. He now exists outside of it. And so, as uh, he he begins to move, it says that he created. That is a very specific and a very important word, and it doesn't mean this is where we lose something in translation that happens from time to time. And I, look, I, I am so grateful for all of the English translations that we have, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to study God's word on our own. Um, but something does get lost. And this word created is the Hebrew word bara. And it's, it is only used for God. Like, he's the only, he, God can be the only possible subject for that verb. It's something that only he can do. Brevard Child says, the verb designates an activity confined solely to the deity without human analogy. That means there's no, there's no scenario where we can use that word to apply to something we can do. I mean, we can make things, right? Like, who's... <laughs> We like, we'd make crafts, you know, we're into crocheting, or we build cars, or we make, we make things, but we cannot create in the way that God does. So it designates an activity confined solely to the deity without human analogy, which makes use of no material out of which creation proceeds. The fancy term, if you're into apologetics in Latin, the fancy term is, is that God created ex nihilo. He created out of nothing. There was nothing, and then God spoke, and something came about. The world, what he said, happened, and there was nothing. And, and folks, this is, this is where people who don't believe God created the world get kind of backed into a corner. Well, where did the materials come from to create the universe? We're not sure, and I've heard some really wonderful explanations uh, people who are smart and have lots of PhDs and many letters behind their names, and they'll say crazy things like, maybe the aliens planted those things in the universe. Oh, but we don't believe in God, but we're the crazy ones, right? Where did the materials come from? We know, inherently, we know that we humans can't create something from nothing, and that inherently we understand that something doesn't come from nothing. So what do we do? God created. He did it. His word, he spoke and it happened. And this is getting at the root of why some of this has always been or why, why this part of the Bible has always been controversial. You go talk to somebody about, um, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and they're right there with you. I don't care who they are. Oh, of course. You know, the Christian ethic, I'm down with all of that. Love your neighbor. I'm totally down with, you know, treat others the way that you want to be treated. Our society knows the golden rule, and they're all, they're fine with it. 
But then you start saying things like, no, God, in the beginning, God created. Well, now hold on. That we don't like. In the ancient Near East, instead of giving Yahweh or Elohim, God, the credit, they gave the gods credit. Well, it couldn't have been this one mighty God. It had to be these other gods that are awfully strange and hard to deal with. Today, we just replace God with evolution. We have to explain how we got here. But if these five words, in the, be- in the beginning, I don't know how to count. Look, I'm a preacher, not a mathematician. Don't ask me to count. <laughs> in the beginning, God created. If those five words are true, if they're true, that has monumental consequences in our lives. And that's why I say, if, if that's not true, Toss the whole rest of it. But if they are true, if it is true that in the beginning, God created this world, that means something for us. It has a very practical impact on our lives. And so we can do one of three things. We can either ignore it and say, no, he didn't, and just move along and just go about our business, live our lives as we so choose. No, God didn't create it. Okay. We can... We can explain it away and kind of say, well, you know, God didn't really create. He did this and that, or maybe there was this other solution. We can, we can interpret our way around it if we want, or, or we can submit to those five words. In the beginning, God created. Now, let's be honest. Submission has not been our forte as a race for the past however many thousands of years we've been here. But what we say about those five words is, is almost sort of a litmus test uh, for, for what the rest of our beliefs are going to be, the rest of our convictions. I mean, think about it. We just a few moments ago, we confessed and we, we recited together when Rob said, Christian, what do you believe? What was the first thing we said? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. My, the Apostles' Creed might be on to something. But imagine, folks, there are, there are perhaps thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who claim the name of Christ, and they will say that today, and they don't mean it. They don't believe, well, you know, I don't, that, that's probably not. No. It's the very first part. It's foundational to who we are and The truth is, as we look through the rest of chapter 1, what we see is is submission after submission after submission. We see a triune God that is in complete control of his creation. And he takes chaos and he organizes it. And he brings it into submission to his will. Right? We just... Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Back then and in, in those days, the, uh, when, when people thought about the sea, they, that, that was a fearful thing. It was dangerous. It was dark. It was scary. It was chaotic to go out onto the sea. It was not a place you wanted to go. And, and so it symbolized a lot of the uh, what we would think of as the enemy activity. It symbolized a lot of the things that were evil and scary and wicked. And now God's spirit hovers over that and he takes control of it and he begins to organize. This is God's world. He designed it. And, and y'all, he makes the rules about it. And so when we consider creation, when we consider that all of the elements of creation that God spoke into being also submitted to his will instantly and without question, uh, it begs the question, are we doing the same thing? It, it makes me think about uh, the place that I immediately go is Job. <clears throat> I think that's a strange place to go, but if you're familiar with the, the story of Job, of course, the bad things happen at the beginning of the story. Job gets some... <clears throat> well-intentioned but bad advice from his friends. And then Job starts asking questions of God. Now, it's not wrong to ask God questions. But the spirit in which Job was asking questions got a little spicy. And so God shows up 
And God says, all right, Job, gird up your loins like a man. It's time for me to start asking questions, and you answer. And Job says, oops. <laughs> and so God goes on for something like three, four chapters asking Job questions. Where were you when I created the world? And then you get to Job 42, and Job replies to God, and I love this, and, and like this should be our heart as we consider the vastness of God and, and the greatness of God and His ability to create the world and, and, and design it and make the rules about it. <clears throat> like this should be our heart. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? I love this verse. Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. You know, at some level, I don't need to know exactly how God created the world. I don't need to, like, God, how did you get, you know, how did you make it like that? That's probably too wonderful for me. That doesn't mean we don't explore. That doesn't mean we don't investigate and, and study the creation that God's given us. We do. But there's going to come a point where it exceeds our ability to understand. You said, listen now, and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I reject my words, and I'm sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. <laughs> Y'all don't forget, from dust we came, to dust we will return. He is God, we are not. We're not even close. And as we consider his creation, we consider the design that God has worked into his creation, our attitude should be like Job's, that humble response of, this is, this is too much for me. God, I submit to you and your leadership and your, your lordship. Within these passages uh, of of Genesis, we find God's design and, and purposes for humanity. And again, we'll talk more deeply about that next week. We find that there is value in creation, whether it is the uh, human beings themselves, ourselves. We, there is value in the human simply because God created us, right? There is worth in every single human life. Y'all talk about the, the walk for life. There is value in every single human life. There's value in what God has made for us, the habitat that he's given us to live in. Why? Because it all points to him. It was for our good and for his glory. As we see the, the creation submitting to God, we also see uh, an organization taking place. We know that our God is not a God of confusion, but a God of order. And, and we see that take place in, uh, in his creation. There's a pattern, as, as with so many things of God, there, there is a pattern. And you may not have noticed it, um, but he, he begins by creating what some uh, commentators, and this is a, seems like a silly term, but what some commentators call containers. He creates the heavens, uh, you know, the water and skies and the earth. And then he fills those things with, with what needs to be in them, right? So I've created the heavens, now we're going to put stars and the sun and the moon in the heavens, created water. Now we're going to put fish and, you know, aquatic animals in the water. We've created land. We're going to put animals and plants on the land. We've created the sky because he had to separate and make the sky. So we're going to put, we're going to put birds in the sky. There's an order and a pattern to his creation. It goes straight from heaven down to earth, the, the heavenlies down to, to earth. As he creates, he organizes, and as he organizes, he, as I said, he separates. And if you uh, were paying attention, if it, if it struck you, the word separates used five times in chapter one of Genesis. And, I mean, there's nothing, I'm not going to sit here and blow your mind about what separate means. I think you know what it means. <laughs> some of y'all are over here, and some of y'all are over here, right? That's what it means to separate. Uh, that's what he did. He separated first the light from the dark. He separated the waters to create the seas. He separated day from night. And this is a pattern that continues throughout Scripture, and it's one of those threads that you can pick up in Genesis and then follow that thread as it leads you all the way 
to Revelation. He separates Israel from the other nations. He separates clean from unclean. Uh, This is as we go through Scripture. He separates the Levites, the tribe that's specifically called to serve him in the temple. He separates them from the rest of Israel. By golly, in a few chapters, he's going to separate Noah from the rest of the world in a big way. At the Tower of Babel, he separated the nations. Y'all aren't doing what I told you to do. You're not being you're not being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. You're gathering together. Now get now get out of here. Now separate, fill the earth. In the book of Exodus, God separates His people from uh, from Egypt, and John picks this up in John chapter one of uh, in the first chapter of John's gospel, which you may you may know. You know, John reached back to Genesis 1 and grabbed that up and made a, an unmistakable connection. Like, this is the beginning of the gospel, and this begin. Let me tell you what you didn't know about Genesis 1 and that, that, that everything that was happening then, Jesus was involved in, and that Christ was involved in. In John 1, 1 uh, he says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing that was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Separation of light and dark. And of course, in in kind of the spiritual metaphor sense, darkness in and of itself isn't isn't bad. We're grateful that it gets dark at night so that we can rest. But kind of symbolically and metaphorically, darkness has always been associated with evil. I mean, that's the time. If you're going to go out and do something you shouldn't do, it's going to be when? It's going to be at dark. It's when you can be sneaky. It's when you think you can't be seen, even though uh, the darkness is as light to God. But he separates the light and the darkness. This, what God did in creation, in that separating and organizing, he continues to do with his people, with us, through Christ. Through Christ and his shed blood on the cross and the redemption that he offers us, God draws us out. He calls us out of the world and makes us different from the rest of the world. We are the, we're now in the light not like the darkness of the rest of the world. We are the called out ones, the the holy ones. That's what it means to be a saint, is to be the called out ones, the holy ones. Peter picks up on this. In in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He said, let there be light, and he saw that the light was good. We've been called into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You have been separated from being not God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All of that language right there, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, speaks to God separating us from the rest of the world. And and, and that's language that Peter has borrowed from the Old Testament. That's how God has always spoken about his people. And praise God, through Christ, through his shed blood, we are grafted in to those things. That now we have been chosen. We are a royal priesthood. We are to the world what the priesthood was designed to be to the nation of Israel. We are a holy nation. To be holy is to be called out, a people for his own possession. And what does does even Jesus say? You think, wow, this this doesn't seem very fair and very nice and kind. But even Jesus says, listen, there's a separation. The wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats, right? This, what God did in creation and in separating and organizing, he continues to do throughout redemptive history. And then Peter gives us sort of part of our mission as believers. Why did God do this? So that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
what's the um, answer? Is it question one of the, the catechism? What is the chief end of man? Yeah. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Thank you, Stan. Gold star. <laughs> yeah. That's just, that's just another way of saying that we may proclaim the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Glorify God. We are called out to then glorify him. God has done great things for us. He has, by his might and power, he has created everything. He created the universe. In his grace and in his mercy, he has called us to himself out of the world. And so now we are called to live like it. And how do we do that? Very simple. What we've talked about already. We submit to his design. We submit to God's design. There are times when the world is going to say, this is what we should do. And God says, no, this is what you should do. Now we pick. We can either do things the world way, world's way or we can do things God's way. Now, I promise you, if you look throughout human history, you'll find that the world messes it up all the time, like with regularity. Oh, this is what we should do. Well, that didn't work. Let's do this. And then God all along is like, this is the design. Just do this, and there'll be blessings just by living by my design. One that's always before us these days, God created them male and female. God says there's but two genders. Ah, the world says there's 47. Who are you going to follow? God's design or the world's? To live like, like we've been called out, we submit to his design, we proclaim his praises. Look, that's, that's it. Like we are, we are the, we should lead the world in worship of God. I know that sounds silly, but it's true. And as we'll see in, in the next, either next week or in the next chapter, and we, we catch a glimpse of it right here at the end of, of chapter 1, we're to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. We are called to have dominion over creation. What does that mean? Well, come back next week, and we'll talk about it then. But the question for us today, the question I want to leave you with is, will, will you do these things? Will you submit to God's design? Will you submit to his design for salvation first and foremost? Because there's really not much for you without that. Will you, will you submit to his, his lordship and be brought into a redeemed life with him? Will you submit to his design for, for human life, for every aspect of human life, whether it's uh, being a husband or a wife or parenting or, or how we conduct ourselves at work or how we conduct ourselves at school or how, how we honor our parents as, as kids. Will we submit to God's design for that as the church or are we going to try to do our own thing? Will you proclaim his praises because of all that he has done and he is infinitely worthy? And will we as the church carry his kingdom out into this world and spread the good news, and the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father, you are God of this world. You created it. We confess, Lord, that we believe, I believe, that in the beginning that you created the heavens and the earth. And Father, I pray that each and every one of us will live our lives in light of that simple truth. Lord, that we would submit to you. We would submit to your design, to your word. Father, that we would proclaim your praises because you are worthy and because of the great and mighty things that you have done, because you have redeemed us and made us new and forgiven us of our sins. And Father, I pray that we would, would do what you've commanded us and, and steward this earth as your people that we would spread your kingdom out further and further to the edges of all creation. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.